This episode of The History Guy is brought to you by Incogni. Tornadoes are actually surprisingly common, especially here in the United States, where some three-quarters of the world's tornadoes occur. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, some 1,200 tornadoes on average occur in the United States every year, even though most of those don't do any property damage and only around 5% cause significant damage and or deaths. Still, those few significant storms a year are definitely a significant part of American history. But a particularly damaging storm in 1948 not only changed history, it transformed the very way that we understand tornadoes, resulting in the world's first tornado warning. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Another email today and yet another data breach. Like everyone, I do a lot online, shopping, banking, healthcare, and it seems like these data breaches come all the time. There's just so many ways for your data to get out. Enter the shadowy world of the data broker. These are virtual pirates who collect and share and sell your private information, like your social security number, which can put your finances at risk, or even your home address or your telephone number, which can place you and your family at risk. But what can you do about it? Now, the law says that you can demand that these data brokers take your information down, but how do you actually make that happen? And, and who's the time to do that? Incogni does. And thank you, Incogni, for sponsoring this episode of The History Guy. And thank you for helping me to catch those data pirates and make them take my personal information off the market. Incogni is an automatic data removal tool that took only a few minutes for me to sign up for back in September. And since then, Incogni has got my data taken down from 136 sites and saving me over 100 hours of work. And Incogni keeps me regularly updated about the removal requests that are still in progress. And I'll tell you, the reduction in spam is really noticeable. So go to incogni.com slash the history guy and use the code the history guy to get your exclusive offer of 60% off an annual plan. That's incogni.com slash the history guy using the code the history guy or click the link in the description and take your personal data off the market. Clarence A. Tinker was a member of the Osage Nation an officer in the United States Army Air Corps. In 1942, he was promoted to the rank of Major General, the first officer of Native American descent to reach that rank. He died June 7, 1942, when the LB-30 bomber he was piloting crashed into the sea during the Battle of Midway. He was the first American general to die in the war. On October 14, 1942, General Henry Hap Arnold, chief of the Army Air Corps, ordered that a base under construction in Oklahoma City, then called the Midwest Air Depot, be named in Tinker's honor. During the war, Tinker Field, which was adjacent to a Douglas Aircraft Assembly plant, repaired and modified B-17, B-24, and B-29 bombers, as well as overhauling thousands of aircraft engines. Made a permanent base after the war when the United States Air Force was created in 1947, the installation became Tinker Air Force Base. During the 1950s, Tinker Air Force Base was described as the Air Force's largest repair and maintenance depot and continued its role of modifying and repairing aircraft, including B-29s, B-47s, C-97s, KC-35s, and B-52s, as well as maintaining and overhauling several types of jet engines. James L. Crowder, chief of the Office of History of the Oklahoma City Air Logistics Center at Tinker Air Force Base, wrote in 1998, Tinker Air Force Base was only six years old at the time, but World War II, rapid demobilization, and major facility expansion had given the airfield significant maturity and recognition. At the beginning of 1948, the Oklahoma City Air Material Area was Uncle Sam's largest repair and maintenance depot in the country. Spread over 2,400 acres, the base encompassed 552 buildings and employed nearly 12,000 military and civilian workers. On March 20, 1948, the Oklahoma City Daily Oklahoman weather report read, Fair and continued mild Saturday, high temperature 73, increasing cloudiness and warmer Saturday night. There was no prediction of severe storms, but meteorologist Robert Maddox of the University of Oklahoma noted in a 1999 edition of the journal Weather Forecasting that conditions changed during the day. During the day, the dry line retreated towards the west and north, allowing moist, low-level air from the Gulf of Mexico to spread over most of Oklahoma. This shift in the dew line would have significant consequences. 
But at Tinker, the forecasters at the base weather station were not aware of the shift. Robert C. Miller, a captain at the time, wrote in 1978, There were two of us on shift that night. My backup forecaster was a staff sergeant, also new to the Tinker weather station. We analyzed the latest surface weather maps and upper charts and arrived at the sage conclusion that except for moderately gusty surface winds, we were in for a dry and dull night. We were not astute enough to note that the upper air analysis, received in completed form over the facsimile net from the United States Weather Bureau in Washington, depicted erroneously analyzed moisture fields. We issued a base warning for gusty surface winds up to 35 miles per hour without thunderstorms, effective at 9 p.m. local time. However, he continues, This forecast gravely underestimated the gravity of the situation. Shortly after 9 p.m., stations to our west and southwest began reporting lightning, and by 9.30, thunderstorms were in progress, and to our surprise, detectable only 20 miles to the southwest of the base. The leading thunderstorm cells looked vicious and were moving very fast. The sergeant began typing up a warning for thunderstorms accompanied by stronger gusts, even though we were too late to alert the base and secure the aircraft. But even that report would have underestimated the gravity of the situation, Miller explained. I was rudely awakened to the sometimes vicious vagaries of Mother Nature. Crowder writes, The tornadic activity came in from the southwest, touching down after bouncing over a lot of barren territory. Miller recalled at 9.52 p.m., the squall line moved across Will Rogers Airport, seven miles to our west-southwest. To our horror, they reported a heavy thunderstorm with winds gusting to 92 miles per hour. And worse, at the end of the message, Tornado South, on ground. Moving northeast, Crowder explains, the tornado then traveled the 10 miles to Tinker, leaving a path of shattered signs, uprooted trees, and damaged buildings. For those who dared look, it was clearly visible due to the nearly continuous lightning. The Associated Press reported the next day that the tornado, accompanied by a thunderstorm and heavy rain, blew in over the prairie from the northwest. The Associated Press quoted Tinker aircraft dispatcher Ralph E. Purisful, I knew right away it was a tornado. First thing I did was duck under my desk. I took a peek and saw a P-47 being blown by the window. Several other planes were being lifted into the air and tossed hundreds of feet away. Then I stuck my face as far down on the floor as I could. Miller reported at 10 p.m. the large tornado, visible in a vivid background of continuous lightning and accompanied by crashing thunder, began moving from the southwest to the northeast across the base. We watched it, not really believing, as it passed just east of the large hangars in the operations building where we crouched in near panic. John Hamilton was working on an aircraft when the tornado struck. The Associated Press reported that Hamilton clinched the wheel of the huge B-29 bomber he had been working on, but the tornado picked up the craft and hurled it several hundred yards. I was terror-stricken, said Hamilton, so I began crawling towards the operations office. It seemed like it was a hundred yards of nightmare. Crowder told the story of Gene Brock, a 16-year-old member of the local Civil Air Patrol, who was in observation training in the control tower when the tornado hit. He told reporters he did not know whether to stay in the swaying tower atop Building 240 or to try to get down, but the storm passed through before he could decide. He received minor injuries from exploding glass. Miller explained that the glass in the control tower succumbed to the pressure differential caused by the vortex, and all the glass shattered. The tower had recorded winds of 78 miles per hour before its equipment blew away, although the forecasters at the weather station estimated winds had reached over 100 miles per hour. The Associated Press summarized the damage. A tornado, which took 100 airplanes and tossed them about Tinker Air Force Base for seven minutes Saturday night, caused damage officially estimated at $15 million to aircraft alone. In addition to the aircraft, 50 were destroyed and 50 others damaged. Base Maintenance Chief Colonel A.G. Hewitt reported that seven small storage buildings were leveled and several others damaged. And 100 special purpose vehicles were also damaged. Although no one had died at the base, two airmen and four civilians were injured. And the Tulsa Tribune noted that the storm also blew an Oklahoma City grocery store off its foundations and injured three persons, although none seriously. Despite damaging only an estimated 5% of the hundreds of planes in storage area about the field, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration notes that the storm was the most costly in terms of property damage that the state of Oklahoma had ever seen to that time. This was obviously a problem for the Air Force. 
Charlie Cripps of the National Severe Storm Laboratory explains. Major Ernest Fawbush, in charge of the Tinker Weather Station, and Captain Miller were called upon to explain what had happened and why the tornado had not been forecast. Miller wrote that he was nervous about being put on the grill in front of a review board of five general officers, but the board reached its decision early that afternoon. They decided that due to the nature of the storm, it was not forecastable given the present state of the art, and that it was an act of God. That conclusion was unsurprising. Tornadoes had long been considered to be too volatile to predict. In fact, Stephen Corfidi of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma, noted in 1999 that the Weather Bureau, then under the U.S. Army Signal Corps, had banned the use of the word tornado in Signal Corps forecasts, as the chief signal officer believed that public fear induced by a prediction of tornadoes would eventually be greater than that which results from the tornado itself. But Crowder writes, Base Commander Major General Fred S. Fritz Borum wanted to know, first, who was in charge of the installation's weather operations, and second, if they could forecast rain, why couldn't they forecast tornadoes? When told that no one could tell if a tornado was coming until they saw it, the general ignored the answer. He was not satisfied with writing off a $10 million loss as an act of God and waiting for the next one to happen. While he pushed his staff to deliver a disaster preparedness plan for the airfield, He also used the judgmental prerogative of a general and ordered the head of the base weather unit and his deputy to do what no one else had ever accomplished. Fortunately, Miller wrote, Major Fawbush had been interested for some years in such storms, and since I had become most interested overnight, I was most fortunate in being selected to aid in the investigations. The two took on the daunting task, Miller recalled. In three days of highly concentrated effort, we analyzed not only the surface and upper air weather charts prior to the Tinker Tornado, but for several other past tornadic outbreaks. Certain similarities in the weather patterns preceding such storms did appear, and in addition, supported theories advanced by other researchers interested in the cause and behavior of tornadoes. Using our findings and incorporating those of others, we listed several weather parameters considered sufficient to result in significant tornadic outbreaks when all were present in a geographical area at the same time. The problem, Miller noted, was that such a detailed forecast procedure was time and labor consuming and required intensive and specialized analysis. So Fawbush and Miller had created a methodology, but the next problem was how would they test that methodology? No one knew when the situation might arise again. It might be years before they could test their theory. As it turned out, it didn't take long at all, Miller wrote. On the morning, weather charts of the 25th of March 1948, just five days after the Tinker Storm, we noted a great similarity between the charts of the 20th and the 25th. After analyzing the surface and upper air data, a prognostic chart was prepared for 6 p.m. local time, showing the expected position of the various critical parameters. This chart resulted in the somewhat unsettling conclusion that central Oklahoma would be in the primary tornado threat area by late afternoon and early evening. It seemed incredible, considering what Miller described as the infinitesimal possibility of a second tornado striking the same area within 20 years or more, let alone in five days. The two called General Borum, who asked, Are you going to issue a tornado forecast? Fawbush's response was, well, it certainly looks like the 20th, right, Bob? Miller replied, yes, EJ, it certainly looks like it did on the 20th. The three decided to issue a forecast of heavy thunderstorms, something that would place the general's new base warning system into effect. Miller expressed relief at the strategy, writing, the chance of a second tornado hitting the same spot within five days was less than one in 20 million. Far better we should take such odds, rather than actually issue a tornado forecast and be laughed out of Uncle Sam's Air Force. But the storm system advanced more rapidly than it had on the 20th. Miller writes, By 2.30 p.m., we determined the line was moving towards Tinker at 27 miles per hour, which would place it over the base near 6 p.m. E.J. and I glanced rather apprehensively at each other, sensing what was going to happen next. General Borum stood up, looked us in the eye, and asked the unsettling question, Are you going to issue a tornado forecast? The two were in a bind, finally telling the general, No one has ever issued an operational tornado forecast. To which the general replied, You are about to set a precedent. With a sinking feeling in the pits of our stomachs, Miller recalled, EJ composed the historic message and I typed it up and passed it to base operations for dissemination. He went on to write, 
I wondered how I would manage as a civilian, perhaps as an elevator operator. It seemed improbable that anyone would employ as a weather forecaster an idiot who had issued a tornado forecast for a precise location. Crowder writes, The nation's first operational tornado forecast was issued on March 25th, 1948, at 2.50 p.m. Then, the wait. Miller wrote dejectedly, shortly after 5 p.m., the squall line passed through Will Rogers Municipal Airport, but this time, not only didn't they report a tornado, but infinitely worse, a light thunderstorm. Wind gusts to 26 miles per hour and pea-sized hail. That did it. I abandoned ship, leaving a grim Major Fabush to go down with the vessel. The second tornado to strike Tinker Air Force Base in five days struck shortly after 6 p.m., the time that Fabush and Miller had predicted. The Daily Oklahoman wrote the next day, a tornado dipped into Tinker Field for the second time within a week Thursday night, it destroyed 35 planes and damaged 49 others. A 1999 publication of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration wrote, aircraft had been secured and inbound traffic had been diverted, but the storm still caused $6 million in damage. Nevertheless, the toll would have been much greater had it not been for Fabush and Miller's amazingly accurate forecast. Robert Maddox and Charlie Crisp of the National Severe Storms Laboratory noted the extremely unusual meteorological situation. Two tornadoes hitting the same location within five days, coupled with the fortuitous forecast of the event, had a profound impact on the evolution of operational severe weather forecasting in the United States. Miller had feared the daring forecast might lead to his ruin. Instead, the NOAA publication continues, Fob Bush and Miller became instant heroes. Their forecast techniques were soon adopted throughout the meteorological community. In modified form, their work remains in use today. Charles Doswell III of the National Severe Storms Laboratory noted that while the roots of tornado forecasting go all the way back to the 19th century, it wasn't until the early 1950s that serious tornado forecasting began. He argues that it was the successes of Fawbush and Miller that clearly paved the way for a civilian tornado forecasting system. While that system is less than perfect today, the problem isn't so much in predicting the storms as in communicating the information in a timely and effective manner. But still, a 2006 study published in the journal Weather and Forecasting noted that tornado warnings have a significant and consistent effect, reducing injuries due to tornadoes by more than 40%. Today, a historical marker at Tinker Air Force Base commemorates the nation's first tornado forecast. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy, and if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo.